And now it's time for your second cup of political brew. Good morning again. Welcome back to New Center Maine's Political Brew. Glad you could be with us. We're here this morning with Phil Harriman and Ethan Strimling. Gentlemen, uh, there's been a lot going on. Governor Mills this past week offered a tax conformity compromise, which will allow Maine businesses that got less than a million dollars through the federal Paycheck Protection Program loans will not have to pay tax. The administration says that covers 99% of the loans, and the 1% that got more than a million will pay tax. Ethan, is this a good plan? Well, it's better than it was before, but you have to remember, I mean, even this uh, option, what it means is that $82 million of your money, my money, everybody's money is going to be given to businesses that made a profit last year, right? Inherently, they have to have made a profit to be able to write this off. So you're basically saying to companies that did okay last year, that made their way through it, that you're going to give them additional money and you're going to take that from the rainy day fund something that Paul LePage and Republicans have fought very hard to try to build up for days when things are going to be rough. And honestly, that's $82 million. I, I could think of a hundred other ways to spend uh, so better than what it was before, but still not good policy. So is this just political damage control by the governor? Uh, you know, I, I think that she certainly had to walk it back from where it was before, but I, you know, she should have stuck to her guns and said, hey, this is uh, this is the right policy. We should be, if you made a profit last year, I'm not gonna give you an extra double dip. What do you think, Phil? This is one of those instances where the decision is whether or not Maine tax code will conform with federal tax code. And thus we've had this, this controversy and the governor could have stuck to her position to say, no, uh, we're gonna impose the Maine uh, income tax on that loan forgiveness, even though Washington chose uh, to leave it tax free. She could have stuck to that position and let the legislature debate it out. But I, I sense that she got so much pushback from legislators on both sides of the aisle. She put this compromise out there. And let's let's be honest. There are, as Ethan says, a hundred ways to spend more money. And the legislature is really good at doing that. And it's their responsibility to balance this budget. And this is one of the tools that she's given them uh, to work with. Uh, the National Republican Congressional Committee has put out a list of what it says are 47 Republican pickup opportunities in the 2022 election cycle. And Maine's Jared Golden is listed, even though he won comfortably in his second district, even as Donald Trump was winning over Joe Biden there. Uh, Ethan, what do you make of this? Why, why this particular, why is he on that list? Look, he's got to make sure that he... Uh, stays close to his constituents. There will be a backlash against the incumbent president. That is going to be a seat that's going to be vulnerable. That always happens in the midterm races. Uh, but as you said, he won in the districts in which Donald Trump won by eight points, and he still won by six. So that's a 14-point swing that Republicans would really have to find a way to shift in the end. So I, I think that Jared is you know, going to be solid. He's very smart at what he does. But uh, clearly, Republicans uh, wanted this on their list so they could show that they could win back the House. And, you know, within minutes, the Democrats were sending out fundraisers, too. So. Do you think it's a vulnerable seat, Phil? Uh, less vulnerable this time around. The second election for an incumbent is always the most difficult. Jared got past that, even in a district where the further you are from the second congressional district, more statistically, it looks like that seat could be won by the Republican. But I think Jared Golden so far has walked that balance point, if you will, between his Democrat philosophies and his Republican leaning district. And I think Ethan in a rare form of bipartisanship this morning has analyzed this just right. Now we talked about the congressional prospects in 2022. What about the race for governor? Governor Janet Mills tells us she sees no reason why she wouldn't seek reelection. So Democrats who might like to run are staying quiet for now. And former Governor Paul LePage has done nothing to take himself out of contention for the GOP. So any ambitious Republicans may be reluctant to start a campaign. So, Ethan, I guess I'd ask, are we going to have any primaries for governor next year? Uh, I expect we'll have some on the Republican side. I don't know if LePage will clear out the field. There may be some if he does decide to run. I mean, you know, the weird thing is that neither one of them has fully declared. Janet Mills, you know, she just has not raised any money. She doesn't have to be publicly doing a lot, but I hope that behind the scenes she's doing a lot more than seems to be uh, than what we seem to see at this point because she needs to get prepared because you're right. Democrats don't want to lose this seat. So we want our nominee to be very strong and very ready for this. 
Uh, LePage, I don't know. I, I think he's a little more talk, a little more bluster. So I think in the end, he doesn't run and some other Republicans get in. What do you make of it, Phil? Well, I, I agree with Ethan on his comment about uh, former Governor Paul LePage. If I'm Governor LePage, I am going to keep a low profile while the, the Republican backlash, if you will, from the insurrection in, in Washington drifts off the front page. Uh, so I think if he is going to run, he's being very strategic to not uh, send signals during this period of time. And I'm also aware of uh, potential Republican candidates who are preparing that if he does indeed, as Ethan suspects, not run, uh, there will be a viable field of Republican candidates for the nomination. Could be pretty crowded. We'll see what right. happens. Uh, let's wrap it up uh, in, uh, with the uh, impeachment trial aside. Who are the winners and losers in politics this week, Phil? Well, my loser is the, whoever's behind the uh, identity theft uh, at the Department of Labor for people who are proposedly filing for unemployment benefits. They are clearly my loser of the week. And the winner of the week is our prestigious Jackson Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine, who has been uh, leading the way in helping us in Maine uh, determine these various variants of the COVID-19. We are well out in front of the rest of the country because of the Jackson Laboratory. All right, and Ethan? Uh, I'm going to go with two losers this week, CMP, Maine Health. We spoke about them. They're both just from a public relations and from a real core values place. Uh, they are just showing some colors that I think are not reflecting well in the state of the Maine. And for the winner of the week, it's Valentine's Day. So I got to oh, give a right. shout out to my sweetie <laughs> Stephanie out there. Oh, you're a smoothie, awesome. man. What an overachiever. you got to be kidding me. Oh, well, I'm hoping that I'll be the winner of the week now. <laughs> We're all sharing the love on Valentine's Day. All right, Phil, Ethan, thanks so much. Thank you for being with us. New Center Maine is back after this.